idea that disease could be caused by microscopic forms of life. Uh, Robert Koch, and we still use Koch's postulates in public health today, was studying a disease called consumption, which is a terrible, awful, feverish disease where people cough up blood and they kind of waste away, like they're consumed from the inside. And the belief was is that consumptives got that way because they were very um, uh, sensitive and emotional and artistic and effeminate. Um, there's uh, uh, an opera by Puccini about consumptives on the left bank of Paris. A a and what uh, Koch found was that none of that was true. Um, they did not have a consumptive temperament. That's the old word for personality. Consumption was, in fact, caused by a small bacteria called the tuberculosis spore, and that's why we don't call consumption consumption anymore. We call it tuberculosis. Rudolf Virchow was the father of modern pathology. Ignaz Semmelweis was the first guy who put all the ideas together into clinical trial. A and, and it's not that these ideas came together smoothly. This guy tried to have this guy thrown out of medicine, okay? But <laughs> because their ideas were based on the scientific method, because their hypotheses were testable, their ideas stood the test of time, and they coalesced into our modern disease model. And if I could show you that model, it basically says this. You got an organ, it gets a defect, and as a result, you see symptoms. It doesn't matter what the organ is, bone, liver, kidney, who cares? The defect is some physical cellular defect. Cells die or cancer develops, an infection perhaps. There's some physical defect in that organ what explains what you're seeing in the patient. Now I know that doesn't look like much, organ defect symptoms. As a matter of fact, that little schematic is everything that we do in Western medicine. Cue the thunder. That's right. <laughs> I've just put <laughs> I've just put all of Western medicine on the board, and <laughs> and what is this thing? It's a causal model. The power of the disease model was to get rid of all those bad explanations of disease: personality, what mommy did, race, gender, possession by demons. This model got rid of all of that, and it got us to the actual cause that was causing what we were seeing in the patient. And it was a very, very powerful model. I'll show you how it works. Let's say you go skiing, perhaps in the beautiful state of Utah. And you ski a little too fast, and you hit a tree. You might get a defect in one of your organs, all right? You might get a <laughs> fracture in this organ, the long bone of the legs called the femur. And if you get that defect in that organ, you're going to show certain symptoms. Everybody gets the same symptoms. They're the four classic symptoms of a broken leg. And the way this model works is when the patient rolls in the ER door, we fit what we're seeing to the model, and this is the way a broken leg fits the disease model. The organ is a femur, the defect is a fracture, and then the screaming and the bleeding and the <laughs> bone sticking out. Every single one of those symptoms can be traced back to that defect in that organ. <laughs> now, <laughs> what the model does is it tells us where to go. Do we go here? No, we don't. We do not chase symptoms in medicine. We go here, we fix the defect, and with time and healing and physical therapy, the symptoms go away. So that's the way a broken leg fits the disease model. That's an illness we can cure. Let me show you one we can only treat. This is diabetes. This time, the organ in question is the pancreas. There's a defect in these special cells that make insulin, and so there's no insulin. And if you get that defect in that organ, you're gonna show the symptoms of diabetes. There are so many of them, I couldn't fit them all in there. But every single one of those symptoms, the blurred vision, the wounds that don't heal, the numbness in the fingers and the toes, all of it can be traced back to that defect in that organ. Now, before doctors had this disease model, what they tried to do was chase down and fix each individual symptom, a and it didn't work. Diabetics died in childhood. But once they had the model, the model told them exactly what to do. You just replace the insulin. And it, it's easier said than done, but if you do it correctly, all of those symptoms disappear. So before we had the model, diabetics died in childhood. After we had the model, diabetics had a fighting chance. And so this was an immensely powerful causal model at describing disease. This baby doubled the human lifespan in only 100 years. And let me tell you something. 100 years ago, doctors knew that. They knew they had a powerful model. They knew that this new modern scientific definition of disease was going to make the new modern scientific practice of medicine very powerful. But they also figured out that they had to figure out 
right away what the disease and what isn't. Who will be a patient and who will medicine wash its hands of? Well, it was easy to see how broken legs and diabetes fit this model. And so doctors said, okay, those are diseases, these are patients, we will handle that. And today in medicine, we have a field called orthopedic surgery and a field called endocrinology. But it was not as easy to see how things like addiction might fit the model. What was the organ? Was it the brain? Was it the liver? A hundred years ago, they didn't know. What's the nature of the defect? Hadn't a clue. And let's not forget that the symptoms of addiction, well, they don't look like symptoms at first glance. They just look like straight up badness. And so when doctors could not readily fit addiction to this model, <laughs> they carved it out. And they said, this is no longer a disease, and these are no longer patients, and we do not handle this. That didn't mean that addiction just disappeared. It meant that another group in our society had to come in and clean up the mess. And that group was the criminal justice system. And so based on that decision made by doctors, and it was really only about 10 years when people who were within the law, patients, yes, drug addicts, but could go to their doctor and be treated, probably not you know, always the best, but you know, they had something. These people were recast into people outside the law, largely criminals, who had to act criminally simply to get their drugs, and therefore that set up a self-fulfilling prophecy about how addicts are criminals but the guys are in jail, you know, and it just goes back and forth. And it set in, in motion a series of, a chain of events that eventually led us to 2.3 million people in prison. That is not just the highest per capita incarceration rate on the planet, which it is. Higher than China, higher than Russia. It's one of the highest per capita incarceration rates in human history. When you get into numbers like 2.3 million, you make public health doctors very nervous because we can start to use words like prevalence and incidence and epidemic. This cannot go on. This is a great moral evil, and I believe history will bear me out on that. The idea that you can buy stock in for-profit prisons, that you could be paid a dividend off the incarceration of another human being. That is easily as evil as anything that the tobacco industry has ever done. Do you see how if I was ever able to show how addiction fit that model, if I could do what Dr. Silkwood, who wrote the doctor's opinion, the very first part of the big book of AA, the anchor of AA, a statement by Bill Wilson's doctor that says, I'm not sure, I, I can't prove it, but I kind of think alcoholism might be a disease. If we could do what he couldn't do, if we could walk into a court of law and say, we know the part of the brain that's involved in addiction. We know the nature of the defect. And we can explain everything that addicts do, all those terrible, awful, frustrating symptoms by relating it back to that defect in that organ, then we would have met the burden of proof. We would have finally been able to show how addiction fits that model. And all of this would start changing back. And for 100 years, we have been unable to do that. We have been unable to fit addiction to our definition of disease. Until today, it has really just been in the last 10 years that we have finally learned enough about the brain that I can tell you exactly how it fits that model. I can tell you the part of the brain. I can tell you the nature of the defect. And I can explain everything that addicts do without having to refer back to their bad morals or their bad personalities, or their bad parents. And I think this information has the power to change the world, shoot funding. <laughs> <laughs> you see, what I've noticed, and I've, I've kind of made up a, a, a word for this, I've borrowed it from zoology, there is a, a sort of ontogeny of disease. Diseases don't just sort of spring into the public's mind. They evolve into the public's mind over time. And there are certain things that drive that. Um, for instance, most people who are